Christina Brennan. Christina, are you ready to be great today? Of course. Christina is a communication consultant, presentation coach, and poor people's campaign manager. Christina builds connections. She just wants to see everyone make it. She teaches the communication skills necessary to build new systems where everyone can make it. Christina has worked with startups, SMBs, and enterprise clients in PR, advertising, marketing, sales, and, and journalism. Has a bachelor's in, in communication with a business minor from the University of Colorado, Colorado, Colorado Springs. Landing the message was, like, was the common thread. So now she teaches unconventional entrepreneurs how to learn the audiences and develop messaging that resonates and drives action. She's coached nearly 200 star founders and entrepreneurs, helping dozens win competition, competitions like Founders Live and F-Bombs Pitches of Bitches. Christina, thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. I really appreciate the invite. I know I've been putting it off for a little bit, so glad uh, we made it happen. All good. So, Christina, on, on my podcast, I usually talk about politics and social issues. That's like pretty much like your front and center with that. It's pretty much makes you, make you, make you all right. So, we're going to talk about that real fast. Yeah, it'd probably be a boring podcast yeah. if we didn't talk about yeah. it. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's even on your LinkedIn profile, too. So, first, let's talk about defund the police. What does that statement even mean? Of course, it's controversial. Some people see it means it means get rid of police completely. It means like, you know, like have them do different things, like not social action stuff or mental illness helps. Like what does that mean from your point of view? Yeah, I don't want to speak for, you know, any of the activists that are out there and came up with those specific words. Uh, but how I understand it, interpret it is ex like exactly what it sounds like. It's defunding the police the same way we defund schools, the same way we defund all sorts of other things because we have to put the money somewhere else. It's needed elsewhere. Um, and so that's where the second demand um, that you're, you're talking about. I have some artwork on my LinkedIn profile that has the three core demands from the main organizers here in the streets in Seattle. So that's going to be your morning march, your every night daily demonstration. I think I can't remember their name exactly. Um, and E-N-D-D, um, King County Equity Now, several other organizers standing behind these three demands. Um, so defund the police invest in community and free all the protesters. So the defunding the police in this case is necessary to invest in community. Those go hand in hand. Um, and then the freeing of the protesters part is uh, very central to the protests and like saying that, you know, these people are exercising their constitutional rights. So not only let them out, but exonerate them from the charges. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's really is that simple, <laughs> but obviously it's controversial, like you said. Yeah. So defund the police, you're saying like, take all the money away from them? That's not the demands that I've heard here in this city, but in general, there are obviously like calls for abolishing the police. And I think if we all took like a big step back, we would agree that an idealistic world would be one where we don't need police, right? Yeah. I, mean, um, I mean, when you think about it, if you go to like rich neighborhoods, there's really no police there, right? Right, lower presence of police, yeah. highly funded schools, got sweet technology, they've got prep programs, there's all sorts of opportunity and paths um, that you're just not seeing in other areas. Um, so especially when we're talking about black communities, you can look at the history of redlining, start there if you wanna understand where that comes from. Um, and Seattle is a really um, interesting example because you see so much growth and progress and you hear a lot of interesting progressive talking points coming from our leaders and the city's very much labeled a progressive city, but when you dig down into the policy, like the state in general is like very regressive, like tax structure. And then when you dig into it, um, it's not as like for the people as you might think, depending on even how you define progressive though, which is why like words matter so much, right? And how we interpret them and who we're talking to and how we're using them. So it's a lot, it definitely is a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so the funnel piece, how do you, how do you convince like, Cause I think this is core, like you call them progressive liberal, they want to defund the police, right? How do you, how do you convince like the other side? Like, no, this isn't a bad idea. Like actually you want to defund the police because all this extra stuff can happen. That's a good question. Um, I really don't know how you take somebody from like, no, we, we need more police. You know, there's people in that, that point of view all the way over to um, defunding the police. And so I think it, I think the most, like, if you're going to change somebody's mind, that's going to come from like one-on-one -on -one conversations. I don't think there's necessarily anything that like the protesters or organizers can do to be out there and change their messaging. We heard, you know, from Barack Obama that like defund the police is not the best terminology for what you're trying to get across. 
Black Lives Matter was too much for some people. There, we could get caught up on the words, right? Which, you know, I love to do, <laughs> but that's taking away from like actually getting to the core thing. Like, why are we talking about that? Why do people feel so harmed? Why do some people not feel safe when they see the police? And so like starting, I think with that, like the why, getting to the root cause and like kind of starting there might be the path, but I don't know, and to then, be honest. Then how, about the, how about the argument where people will say, well, when the police presence is lowered, defunding less, whatever, crime goes up like really high. What that kind of argument? Um, I would have to look at each individual circumstance because like what else is happening? That's why like with the demands here in Seattle, it's not just defund the police, it's invest in community. So like what's what's happening with those funds? Um, and that's why I don't think you see a direct like abolish the police demand right now. It's because there's an understanding that we have a current system. We can't just flip it overnight. So there's going to have to be not just an investment in dollars, but an investment in we want these other forms of service, these other forms of public safety to like work. <laughs> we have to invest in them and believe that those are other ways that can work. Um, and what we also know is that police actually don't prevent crime, right? They show up after it happens. So I think one of the main things that we hear is that people want the money when they say in community, they mean into those things that are gonna prevent crime, housing, is like a huge thing that when people have secure housing uh, um, and can eat, if they can at least have a place to lay their head and be warm and have food in their bellies and make sure that their kids are safe, that that right there would reduce a lot of crime. Yeah, they have a program in Olympia. I can't remember the name of it, but basically like they like cut the police force, like the budget. I suppose I'll make this number up. I suppose they cut by 30%. They took the 30% and invested like social workers. So now it's like, I suppose it was like a, a, like a mental health, a homeless issue in Olympia. Still the police go on these, I can't remember what they're called. Those people go help it out, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm interested to see how that program works out in Olympia. Yeah, I think um, at the end of the day, what we know is that like the current way isn't working. Um, I'm not sure 100% what's going on down in Olympia. I do know that it's definitely an interesting image that in the shadow of the state's capital with these big grandiose buildings with marble floors and right down the street, there's hundreds of people and I don't know what the population is but Olympia is not a big city at all it's not and it's hundreds and hundreds of people that are unsheltered and it, it's it's not freezing always here but it can get freezing here like it's not like we're in a warm climate so people being outside right now this time of year is really tough so we're in the Seattle, Seattle right now we both live in the Seattle area mm -hmm. can you talk some about the, uh, the contradiction of Seattle like you fly in on the plane it's nice beautiful beautiful buildings you know Mount Rainier but then if you get like downtown, it's like it's a whole different story, right? Can you talk about the contradiction? Like the, it's like the public image of Seattle and it's like, okay, what's really going on? Yeah, I think it goes back to kind of what I said earlier. We definitely have like an image thing with Seattle where it's like this pristine, high tech, like everything's, but there's a lot of unaddressed issues. So yeah, when you, when you turn the corner, you can go from seeing this nice pristine building to lots of smells and trash all over the place and that's a nice way to put it nice to smell lots of smells that's a nice way to put it i went to new york last year so they got us beat i think um <laughs> with the smells department but um i think it's uh there's it's i mean marketing in general right like there's yeah. there's a benefit to only showing one side and so um i think you see that though in any major city you're gonna see an image of one thing there's definitely cities that maybe have more of like a bad reputation. We hear like Chicago come up when it talk, people talk about violence and stuff like that. Um, but in general, it's it's never what what you think on the surface. So yeah, I mean, every city has a place you don't want to be like three in the morning, right? Yeah, which is sad. So we got to think about that because a lot of people need to be out three in the morning. Yeah, true. <laughs> so next, talk about investing community. What do you mean by that? You mean investing money, investing man hours, like? Yeah, there's a lot of. Um, a lot of demands right here in the area that I could point to. So King County Equity now, they're very focused so that we're at equity. I definitely wanna keep talking about that throughout the show, but um, they have a few different initiatives on programming for young people, on housing. Um, they're partnered up with Africatown Seattle, which has a land trust, and they're trying to get that um, fully funded so that they can um, build one of the things that they're trying to build and they're trying to get the land Currently, I believe this sound transit is like who owns it, quote unquote. It gets interesting with like government municipalities, like who owns what and all that. But I believe that's who's in control of the land. We'll use that language control. Um, 
and it's unused right now. And of course, the the thought process is that they're going to just sell it for high to a developer at some point. Um, and what we'd rather see, or rather what the demands are is around building a youth achievement center. So that's a very specific demand that folks could look up and see a plan. And it's going to be co-located services. So there's going to be housing, as well as all the other services that go along with that, including education and job training, um, and just whatever opportunities might help those young people transition into adulthood and be able to be independent. I mean, with so many causes, so many, you know, pastors out there, there's so many nonprofits, how does someone pick what they want to, like, how do you recommend to someone, hey, what to pick and, you know, be involved with, you know, it's, it's almost overwhelming, right? Because, like, this, like, for military veteran nonprofits, so, like, 45,000 military veterans nonprofits, right? Dang. Just for veterans, right? So, and then everything else going on, how, do you, how does someone pick? You can't do everything, right? You got to pick and choose, right? Yeah, that's so true. 40, 45,000. It's ridiculous. Um, like, there's like, a... like, just in JBLM, I could be off the number. I think there's like eight nonprofits just help military veterans go fishing, right? Like, do we need eight nonprofits help people go fishing? Probably not, right? Probably not. Um, there's a term we don't have to get too much into it, uh, but the non or yeah, the nonprofit industrial complex. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. You just kind it's of explained thing. it. It's a thing. Um, so yeah, when we're talking about in general, there's there's in our current system, capitalist system, right? Like. There's a lack of resources, essentially. That's the way we've kind of built it. We know it's not 100% true, but that's basically what happens with the nonprofits is they're fighting over a limited amount of resources. Um, we're relying on philanthropy, which is not necessarily going to give us equal outcomes, right? Or even equal input. Um, but yeah, why can't those eight <laughs> nonprofits or eight initiatives come together. Ego, um, I can do it better. You know, I think that plays a lot into it, you know. Yeah. Of course, some of it's like selfish reasons, you know, I want to be the CEO of a nonprofit, it makes you look good, you know, all that stuff, you know, like. Yeah, so there's a lot that goes into it. So definitely doing your homework on that. Like, do you want to support a nonprofit that was started because somebody wants to scratch their. And it was, I can remember what's called, but something where you can look up a nonprofit and say, like, how much goes to admin costs, so much goes to actually helping people. Oh, yeah, yeah. I can't think the name of it. But. I can't either. They're out here? Oh, uh, it's like a national organization, I think. Because oh, okay. it'll be like, you know, the, the, you know, we'll say, I'm making this up. Like, Red Cross spends 25% on admin costs or yeah. such and such, 35%. So, obviously, you probably don't want to help them out because they're, you know, yeah, the, the people exactly getting fat, you know. Yeah, and then, the, I mean, there's an the argument, though, too, that it's like, well, for their reach, the administration costs go up. I don't yeah, know. I mean, maybe so. And then if you want to hire good people, you got to pay more. I mean, that's all that. That's yeah. I'm just an argument too. Yeah. Um, so my advice would be then in that case, do your homework on the org, um, find something that, you know, you have a personal connection with. I think it's more about building relationships and community and thinking more about like mutual aid versus charity or donating and things like that. Like, really thinking about that, like, you're not donating this to some random people that you've built relationships and you might actually know the person who's receiving those clothes that you're donating to the church or the shelter or whatever it is, because you've built some relationships. Um, and so I think that's a way. And then from there, like you're building those relationships, right? You're going to find out about different orgs, different causes, and you'll just, I don't, I know it sounds stupid, but <laughs> you'll just kind of know, like, it's, it's like any relationship, oh, yeah. like, you don't have like you have your checklist for like what you look for in a friend or a relationship, romantic partner, whatever, but you don't really know until you know. And I think that's kind of the same way when it comes to these. So you might have to try out some things. You might go to something and be like, oh yeah, no, those are not the people I'm supporting. I definitely had that experience like early on when I was going to different protests and stuff like that and figuring out like who are the trusted leaders who have been established in this community and are actually from here, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and definitely felt like I was like following. I don't want to say the wrong people, but like maybe people I wasn't exactly aligned with and maybe not the message that I thought I was supporting. So I had to kind of learn along the way too, but it literally took just building relationships and time. So I think just for me, my advice would be just like, don't give up if it's uncomfortable and awkward at first, like keep showing up, do what you can think about, you know, what your strengths are and where your privileges lie. So how do you stop from doing this? Right. Cause like you have your full-time job, like how do you keep from like getting, cause all these nonprofits, you're volunteering, you're you know, most people don't get, are not, not getting paid, right? How do you stuff for me too involved, right? How do you make it for me, like, on, in conversation? Like, if I like a lot of, a lot of people, like, oh, you're volunteering, do more, do more. Next thing you know, you have two full-time jobs, only get paid for one of them, right? How do you keep that balance? Yeah, it's hard. Um, one thing I will say is the Poor People's Campaign is actually not a nonprofit. We're not an official organization. We have no, 
we're not a business. We're not a nothing. We are, uh, we're an organization, I guess, but it's all grassroots. Um, and I think just each person has to decide like what that means to them. Like, I don't know. I don't think about it as separate. Like every day I wake up with like justice on my freaking mind. <laughs> like I'm thinking about like something I've actually been working on a morning routine. So I'm not so girl in the morning. Um, but it's just like, it's just part of my daily life. So in terms of balancing some things that I just had to learn is that to not say yes or no right away. Let me get back to you on that. And like sit with it, look at my schedule, really think about, okay, how much time and energy would it take for me to do this? Um, and I think that's probably been the biggest thing is just like trying to not say yes or no in the moment, because yeah, inevitably you end up with way too much on your plate. And for me, I'm not just working on like the stuff with the campaign. Like I do volunteer coaching stuff with the startup community and I try to give back in that way as well in the business community. So yeah, I can, I could feel some weeks, like I've definitely put in a whole nother 40 hours. So how do you go about saying no, or is that something you don't do enough of telling people no? I probably don't do it enough. Um, I've really learned to, uh, I really grew up with like the, you know, stick to your word and like follow through kind of uh, conditioning, which is very good. You should stick to your word and all of that. But learning that, especially with volunteer stuff, it's okay to be like, never mind, I changed my mind or I need to push this back or something like that. Like even with you, I pushed this interview back, right? Because I was just like, ah, I'm not ready. Um, instead of like stressing out over it and like jumbling something together, like I was like, all right, give me some time. And then you did. Thank you. Um, so that part and then saying no to people that it's like anything, like it, it becomes easier when you practice and then it starts to become like really liberating too. So like, it feels good to say no to things and be like, yeah, I stood in my power. And then it's not just the saying no, it's the saying no without like explaining yourself because that's, I think what we get caught up in. We feel like we have to justify why we're saying no. <laughs> and Maybe you feel that way with certain relationships and that's valid, but in general, like you don't owe anybody an explanation. And so just really changing my mindset around that, that like, it's okay. Yeah. And I could be wrong, but today, today's December 10th. Isn't today like something like human something day, human rights day or something? Yeah. So December 10th was a, a human rights day. And um, I actually tuned into a panel last night that was, I think it was with the civil rights commission for the city of Seattle. I'll be honest, I'll remember who hosted it. Some some municipality related um, group was hosting it, but the theme was um, black excellence. So Nikita Oliver, uh, who most folks around here know her name, she ran for mayor a few years ago. Um, they ran for mayor a few years ago, excuse me. Um, and they were the, the kind of moderator of the panel. And then Omari Salisbury, I think is his last name from Converge Media was on there. One of the Morning March leaders, Katie was on there. Um, Sean Glaze from King County Equity Now was on there. And then um, Jacqueline um, from the Lavender Rights Project was on there. And I think I got all the panelists, <laughs> but uh, I spent some time just kind of learning locally about like how, what we were just talking about at the beginning with defund the police and all that, it really is a human rights issue and how that's interconnected to um, indigenous sovereignty. So they were talking about um, a couple of things, but they were talking about just like how specifically they were all black on the call. So like they were talking about black folks and indigenous folks, like how their freedom is tied together specifically in this country, right? When we talk about like how this country was founded, um, but in general, how all of us, like our liberation really is tied together. If you really, you know, do believe in the freedom and the promise of freedom in America, like when one person is not free, Fannie Lou Hamer said this a long time ago, and she might have been speaking specifically about black folks, but I really do believe like she, she saw the bigger picture as well, that like if one of us is not free, then none of us are free. And like really seeing that. So like, I know that even though I have all these privileges and I'm really just fine, like most of the time, right? <laughs> I'm just fine. I have the freedom to do a majority of the things that I want to do, even with COVID restrictions and all that. But still, I'm still not able to 100% be free because other people are not and like adopting that mindset. And I forgot where I was going with that, but uh, Human Rights Day, um, that's where I was getting at. All of us are connected. Our struggles are connected, even if it doesn't seem like it. Um, and so I think when we adopt that mindset, it makes it easier to show up each day and give a little bit more. So you might not be able to answer this question, but there's all these organizations, like not only see how across the world, right? Like doing like good things or, you know, 
diverse and inclusive equity, all this, all this other matters. Are they working together the right way? Are they fighting each other? What can are they collaborating? Or is like everyone has their own best self interest? Or how's that? What's your point of view on that? It's it's a little bit contradictory. I feel like what I'm about to say, but um, I think having lots of like organizing happening is great. So like what we saw even at the start of COVID before the uprising this summer, when a bunch of new coalitions formed around the protests, there was a bunch of coalitions forming just around mutual aid to take care of people who lost their jobs um, to help kids get laptops. And I mean, I've seen some amazing stuff go down in 2020, the way like community has been able to like strap up and pull things together. And with some of them, I don't know the faces behind that uh, with some of them I do. And it's, it's kind of cool to see how they've been able to pull things together. And so it's like, Oh, there's more orgs. There's more orgs. There's more orgs. Um, and I don't know if we need new language around that, like, cause they are orgs, but they're not like officially on the books orgs, right? Like they're just, it's literally community, like being community and helping each other and starting with meeting like the material needs. And tell me your question one more time. Sorry. Uh, are the organizations collaborating? Oh, are they collaborating? Um, and so I think, yeah, the best ones, I think the ones that are the most effective are collaborating and they're, they're coming out of like addressing a need, right? And then evolving. So an example I would give is no new Washington prisons. They started as a campaign, very specific. It was no new women's prison. There was a, I think it was actually gonna be like a renovation maybe, or maybe it was a new build, but I believe it was in Thurston County maybe. Um, I should know cause I called, but somewhere here in the state of Washington in Maple Lane, they're trying to uh, build a women's prison. It was at the beginning of the COVID outbreak. Um, so there's a big campaign around that because of COVID and pressure from community, they were able to stop that construction. And so they've expanded now their, their mission to no new prisons in Washington state in general. And so their model now is to reach out to different campaigns, like locally, the no new youth jail campaign and different organizers and, and people who are already doing the work, as well as folks who are organizing inside of the prisons um, and connecting that. So I think that that's an example of where you can start something to meet an immediate need and then build out to seek out the people who are already doing the work and figure out how to, to fit into what's already being done um, at a national level or international level. I don't even know. I think I've never, like, I don't think ever donated to, I put money either right in people's hands or like local groups. Like it's okay. pretty rare that <laughs> you're going to see me so, donate to something big. So for the poor people can Poor People's Campaign, what's the mission of that? And what's like the long-term vision? Ooh. So the Poor People's Campaign originally started in like 1967. And before you start, <laughs> poor people campaign, does that mean like, it has to be a certain economic threshold for them to get help? Or what is, a, what is that? Is there a definition for that? Or like a certain economic me metric or they have to live in a certain neighborhood? Or is this like a generic general term? So the term Poor People's Campaign, um, I don't honestly know how they first came up with it, to be honest. What I do know is that the Dr. King um, and many other organizers worked on the original campaign. And the reason that they really formed that was because as they dig, dug deeper into the issues of racism, they realized that there was a pour over and a spillover, that it's, it's a poverty issue as well. So there's a famous speech that I can't think of the name of at the moment, but Dr. King named three systemic evils. So racism, poverty, and militarism. Um, and then shortly after that, he was assassinated. Um, so the term in terms of like where it came from and, and who's a poor person and stuff, I don't really know about that in terms of poor people's campaign. You don't have to be poor to organize um, and be a part of organizing with the poor. And I say with the poor, not for the poor. We're not doing this for poor people. We're doing this with poor people. We're helping them, you know, centering them and following their lead. Um, so this new campaign, a poor people's campaign, a national call for moral revival, we have 18 words for everything, <laughs> now has five systemic evils that we name. Um, so adding in ecological devastation and then what's uh, being described as a distorted moral narrative. So for the religious folks, that's the cherry picking of the Bible to excuse damnation of other people, even though the Bible also says you shouldn't judge other people, et cetera, et cetera, right? Yeah, I skipped that part. But there's also things like what I would call the bootstrap myth that if you just worked harder, like it's your fault and it just the ignoring of like systemic problems. So it's shifting the narrative to look at systemic issues and then how they all interconnect. 
So the mission across the board um, is kind of what I was talking about earlier is connecting work that's already being done, right? There's all this siloed work going on, all this stuff that's being addressed. It's great work, but it's leaving out different pockets because you really can't talk about one of those issues that I named without talking about another one. Or the deeper you get into it, you realize like, okay, well, when we talk about ecological devastation, right? Climate change affects all of us, right? Well, you dig into different things, like we could talk about Flint, Michigan with the water. When you look at air quality, it tends to be the poorer the air quality, the less white people there are there. This is just like facts across this, this country. And if you keep seeing these same issues, there's probably a systems issue, it's probably an input issue that we need to address. Um, so it's about, yeah, addressing the systemic problem is kind of how I would say that and just making sure that the people who are impacted most by whatever that issue is that you're zeroing in on are at the forefront of the solutions because they know what they need. They don't need a bunch of like big Uber national uh, organizations sleeping in. <laughs> so completely random question, right? Do you think people can help better? Like what you use yourself, yourself example, do you think you, you can make better, better change by doing what you're doing? Or would it be better if you actually ran for political office? Ooh. And change them from within, so to speak. Um, I think I believe in the like both and approach, right? It's, it's never either or. We need more people who, again, are experiencing the issues that we're trying to solve to run for office, absolutely. Um, for me personally, I'm not trying to run for office, uh, for anybody's office right now. Um, it's been brought up to me a few times, but not something I'm interested in. So I think it's, it's finding out, yeah, where do you fit in? And for some folks, um, Dr. Barber from the campaign, Reverend Barber, he says, he says like wealthy folks with a conscience or something like that. He's like, we just need their money sometimes too. That's fine. If that's, if that's all you have to give, that's, we'll take it. Um, and so it's, it's figuring out again, like what, what strengths do you have? What type of resources do you have to give? Um, and if you feel called to run for office, I think you should, especially if you're not in that, um, it's usually wealthy people who run because it's hard to run for office or and keep working. Or raise money. Yeah, or running, people who can be yeah. office. It's like fundraise for starters, right? You got to raise money. Yeah, you got to you got to raise money. Um, and then similar to the startup scene, when people put money in, they have expectations. Yeah. <laughs> so that it definitely molds a lot of like our politics in the, the so, U.S. So next question, and like take it for whatever like your your whatever side you're on, right? You have a cause you believe in, it's on left, right, you know, conservative, liberal, you know, pro climate, anti climate, whatever mm -hmm. side you're on, right? Or you invest to someone who's really passionate about something, right? But they're like, man, I, I keep on trying stuff, nothing gets better. It's the same old, same old. I don't know, am I wasting my time? Why am I doing this for? What would you be advice to that person? It almost sounds like the entrepreneur's struggle, right? Yeah. Yep. Like, what am I doing this for? <laughs> I'm not getting anywhere. What is going on? Um, it's gonna happen, you're gonna feel that way. It's like a cycle, right? Like we go through cycles of emotions. Um, but if you keep going, in my experience, you do find those breakthroughs and you do see the impact and you do see the change on that small level. It's harder to see those system changes. You see them looking backwards, right? So when I'm organizing with folks who are 60, 70 years old, they can tell me the things that they've seen change over the years. And we can look at statistics and say, well, some shit actually hasn't changed all that much. It just looks a little different, it got a facelift um what's the same put lipstick on the pig yeah it's like but we were distracted we thought the lipstick was so cool because it was like shimmery and shiny and we're like oh that's so cool that's not even a pig anymore and then like 30 years later like no that's still a pig yeah um so i think um i don't know i'll leave it at that <laughs> and so like we said we start like you know a lot of entrepreneurs business people they live politics those issues out the out the, out the equation right because they don't want to risk losing money or lose, lose, risk losing customers but like you people know what side you're on right how, how like how do you balance that or like how do you balance that with your business or do you even care about that you know you mind like you know i'm gonna lose, I'm gonna lose like x amount of potential revenue each year because my, my beliefs how i stand and how, like what's your take on that and what would you advise to someone else who's like thinking like you know i really believe in this but i'm kind of don't want to be out in the public because i might potentially lose people yeah it's been a um and maybe you can speak to this and maybe you've noticed that it's two years ago i think when we first met it's been about two years there was a little less of that on my LinkedIn, right? Yeah, you definitely, you're definitely all in now. All in now, yeah, all, all in, in now. now. Yeah, there's no, yeah, there's no, yeah. There's... Yeah, there's no, uh, got my, what is it? The banner photo cover image? Yeah, 
So just to make it clear, because I did decide that that was something that I didn't want to have to tiptoe around. I felt like I had to do that in the past. Um, and I can't remember, like, I can't say anything, like one thing like changed my mind, but I do know that one of the things that was holding me back was like this fear of, yeah, not getting the the business or losing business. Shoot, you never know, right? <laughs> like somebody might seem like you guys are aligned and then they see that post and it's like, oh, hell no, I don't want to work with her. Um, and just, I can think what I kind of finally landed on, like within myself was like, I just don't want to work with those people. Have you found that you actually might be gaining business because people who believe in your beliefs have, are okay, have found you? Like you're not tiptoeing and saying no to what you believe in and they're actually getting more business? I haven't necessarily seen it in like a dollar amount, but I do think that that's absolutely um, the case, especially when we're talking about like the coaching work, because a lot of like any type of coach, whether it's life coach, whatever, like there has to just be a click, even if you're just getting a trainer at the gym, right? Like some people you're just not going to click with. And so I think if people see that, like on a socio-political, like just as we are as human beings, we're kind of aligned that might open them up to be like, yeah. And then I'll, I'll probably enjoy working with them more because I won't feel like I'm having to tiptoe around their feelings or anything like that. Um, also say though, that I was working with a woman last year who's like straight up Republican. I was in her house and she got Trump stuff. And, you know, my parents voted for Trump, like dealing with like, it's not like I'm not completely insulated in some like liberal progressive, whatever you want to label it leftist bubble. So that's uh, also, I think helpful for me to where I just realized like people are going to know eventually <laughs> it's going to come up. Um, and if I'm ever applying for an actual job again, I mean, I have an arrest record from protesting. So like, that's going to come up, like might as well just talk about it. So the gig that I have now, we talked about the poor people's campaign and me getting arrested and stuff like that in the interview. Cool. So talk, let's talk about pitch coaching. First of all, for people who don't know, what is a pitch? What does that even mean? In, I think the most common use of it, we hear it, especially here in Seattle, it's like an investor pitch. That's typically what we're talking about. However, it's really morphed and the more we see different types of events happening and we're seeing all sorts of pitches <laughs> coming out um, for different themes and different stuff like that. Even to the point where the pitch competitions, you have different categories where there's just concepts. So people are just pitching ideas. Um, so it can look a little bit different, right? You could also just think of an elevator pitch sales pitch, right? It's all kind of the same thing. If you think about it, you're um, presenting some information with a goal of whether it's persuading them to buy or invest or just to continue the conversation with you, not walk away. I don't know. That doesn't usually happen, but you know what I mean? So what, what, how do you do, how do you, how do you coach people to pitch? Just a matter of like commanding the stage or, you know, pronouncing the words correctly or what's all involved with that? First and foremost, it's all about the message. Like that's the, that's the bottom line. Um, so I'm going to ask questions with anybody, like who's the audience, what's the scenario, like what's the goal? Like what are we getting at here? Because it could give you tips for days and days and days, and then they don't apply to the scenario that you're in. But at the end of the day, like you want to connect with your audience. So um, depending on what that is, if you're going to be on a stage, we're probably going to talk a little bit more about stage presence and that, that physical looking. If um, you just have 30 seconds, maybe we're having to work on keeping it short and concise. And so we're really focused in on the wording. It kind of depends on the scenario, what we're going to start with and focus on. But in general, we want to make sure that uh, the message is on point. So quick to the communication, it's kind of probably, probably the same thing. What do you see people getting wrong by communicating? What are they getting wrong? I think sometimes we just get caught up in especially now because we're like behind screens all the time or even more I should say we already were let's be real a lot of us were already doing the digital thing um quite frequently um we end up talking at people so we're not communicating and have, having a true dialogue we're like listening but just to make sure we have a response ready what's the thing are people what listen to answer and not listen to understand yeah and so for some people it's just because like they're nervous <laughs> They want to make sure that they have something thoughtful to say back or whatever. Um, and then most of the time, though, it's just because we're thinking about ourselves. So somebody says something, the way our brain works is that connects it to something else that's happened to us, our own experience. And so we, sometimes we want to jump right in and be like, oh, yeah, one time this happened to me, too, and make it all about us. And I think just in general, yeah, I guess forgetting that 
like the audience is more important, even if it's just a casual conversation, just being a good listener first, um, I think is probably, and people are like, well, how do you listen if you're doing a pitch like on a stage or something like that? That's doing your homework beforehand and reading body language, again, harder to just do over Zoom. Um, but there's ways to kind of listen without necessarily listening to words. So from experience, how many times does someone have like, you know, quote unquote pitch where they get like become, become an expert? Like how many times pitches someone has to do because they have to have it down, right? Like 10, 20, 30 for like, okay, I, I know what I'm doing. I, I, I'm delivering this message like I'm supposed to. Yeah. Um, that's, I think it comes down to just the individual again, because some people are so natural for them, you know, they'll, they'll do this pitch. And that was the first time I did that. Like, wow, it sounded like you practiced that 50 times. Other people, they practiced it 50 times and they actually got worse each time. <laughs> um, so I think it's like knowing yourself and just like where your nerves are at and all of that and making sure that if you do have enough time to prepare to just give yourself that time and make sure if you know you're new to it, you're practicing and like quote unquote, safe spaces or whatever with friends and family, people who you're maybe less nervous around um, and just kind of figuring out what that sweet spot is for you. Cause again, the more you do it right, the more you'll know. And you're like, okay, so last time I needed to do this amount of preparation. Hopefully this time it's a little bit less and you kind of build up that muscle for it. Cause each pitch is going to be a little bit different. So you've got like your core messaging, but again, who's your audience? Who are you talking to? It's going to switch up just a little bit. So I think some people that mess up is, and tell me if I'm wrong, I think they like mem try to memorize everything, right? Oh, yeah. And instead of like, you know, like, I won't say bullet points and key points, but but people, I know a lot of people want to memorize, right? And and I've never seen anyone, I mean, some people do memorize at all and, you know, it's flawless, but most people don't, right? Yeah, I would say like, when you think about like politicians or whoever, like these speeches, they're somewhat memorized and they have a teleprompter right yeah, I, so it's yeah. like i can be a great speech public speaker too at a teleprompter right i just have to read yeah i'm good there's a trick though to reading and not looking like you're reading yeah, so that's true, there's yeah. some skills in there yeah. but uh but yeah so it's like you can't take necessarily that advice if you're not going to have those same tools available and um i would say start small like come up with just like a short pitch to see if how is your ability to memorize some folks like they haven't tried to memorize something since they were in school to recite it like how often do you really even have to do that in school not not really. I had, when I was in journalism, we had to recite the First Amendment <laughs> word for word. That's the only time I remember ever having to memorize something word for word. Um, it's just not natural. I think for most people, for some people, they're like, no, I need to do it this way. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm not going to fight you on it. Do you have the time to do this? Because it's going to take more time. Um, I like to memorize my transitions because I'm a words person. So I like to have like a nice smooth transition right nice relevant smooth transition and then that does help me to remember especially if you have slides um if you're like okay i need to wrap it up there's my transition and like keep going to the next slide and it just helps me remember my order as well um but bullet points to your point i think is is the main thing that you want to make sure that you're hitting those top level things because nobody knows what you prepared either way whether you memorize it or not so it's not like there's a right way to do it <laughs> so at the end of the day I think um giving yourself as much time as possible but trying to remember the key points and maybe you do have some just really great ways of phrasing something and you want to make sure you say those ones that way but then filling in the rest with just you're just talking about yourself or your business or your project right like you know about it hopefully yeah hopefully <laughs> yeah exactly so what are the difference or different preparation methods between you no know, pitching in person and what we're doing now zoom is it a different method is this is the same or obviously in person mm -hmm. is more personal interaction zoom is never no personal interaction but yeah i'd say maybe um the delivery stuff might be a little bit different in general like if you're presenting on zoom i actually still recommend that if you're able to get that setup going at your house to still stand like you would be presenting in front of a room. There's something about standing yeah. up that makes you pull your shoulders back. And there's just something about that posture. When I do my workshops, I figure it out. I have a standing desk now, but <laughs> you should have seen some of my early stuff at home. Um, I think that that's definitely, and then just like practicing like you would. So if you're going to be staring at a Zoom, then practice staring at your little computer camera and just kind of getting comfortable with that uncomfortable feeling of not being able to see how everybody's receiving it. And then when we get back to doing stuff in person, practice in person with folks, gather your friends or something, 
find a community. There's a lot of stuff out here in Seattle for sure, where you can find some folks to, to practice with and just get those eyeballs like staring at you and looking at their phone. So how do you deal with that, right? It, it, like if you're talking in person, speaking in person or pitching, you know, it's hard enough in person, people on the phone, ignoring you, like how you deal with that with Zoom? Like, or you just have to like, no, everyone, or you have to think to yourself, I'm, I'm only actually talking to these three people. Everyone else, it might be an you know, audience of 40 people on Zoom. They're either like doing other work or do something else, can turn off. Is your mindset just all right? There's 40 people, but I just got to focus on these three people I'm talking to. Yeah, that's definitely hard. I've heard a couple of pieces of advice. Um, I think it depends on the style of the the call too. Like if something's truly like webinar, like presentation style, then the advice that uh, Megan McNally from FBOM gave, she puts like a picture of like an audience. So she has a picture from one of the FBOM events from the stage. So she has like this sea of people and she tapes it up right behind the camera that's on her computer, right? And so she has like this group of women still staring back at like her that. when she does her F-bomb meeting. Tricks her mind. Yeah, yeah, still just gives a little bit of that sense of like there are humans over there. But I kind of like what you're saying. Like you can see a few people on the screen. So just like talk to them, right? And just kind of <laughs> can't worry about the rest. I would say if you have time ahead of time to maybe work with the event organizers or if you're the organizer, is there a way that you can incorporate some polls and some of that stuff that might feel a little forced and cheesy? So like how can you make it less forced and cheesy? Like how can you incorporate a little bit of audience participation? So people at least feel like they're getting a little bit of input in and you can address like, okay, well, 67% of you said this, blah, blah, blah. Maybe you do a poll and you realize you prepared like five minutes of something that they don't give a, about yeah. and you can just go ahead and skip that slide. So That's good advice. yeah, if you can't find a way to engage, do that. Even if like you can't, um, I've done some chat moderation, just helping folks just really manage the chat. So if you're organizing and you can get somebody specifically in that role, then you can encourage the chat and not have to actually engage with it. So you can ask questions and have them like, yeah, drop that in the chat, talk about that. But you don't have to try to like keep an eye on it. You can have somebody kind of keeping that conversation going too. So let's go back to your past a little bit. You played college basketball, right? I did. Let's talk about that. How uh, you, you, you had a scholarship or? Yeah, I got uh, a scholarship. Um, yeah, basketball was, man, I was like the dream. I wanted to play overseas. Uh, I was a journalism major at one point. So like, the vision was to be like over in Europe and South America, like balling and just doing some freelance writing and photography along the way and traveling the world what, on somebody what, else's what, dime. What, what position did you play? Uh, my favorite position was like a three guard, shooting guard as well. And you're like, how tall are you? 5'10". 5'10". On a good day. <laughs> <laughs> and coaches be lying. I don't know how tall I am. I don't know. Um, yeah, I think at one point I was 5'11". But I think about five. <laughs> That's funny. Um, but yeah, I like to shoot and I was not a good shooter at first. So I got really good at that. So I could because like I was taller. I've been this tall since I was like in middle school. Basically, I think I grew like one inch from eighth grade to college. Um, and so they always wanted me in the, in the paint. And I was just like, this is cool, too. Like there's there's some fun things that you get to do. Like it's a very physical sport. Um, yeah, I don't think people realize how physical basketball is. Yeah, I don't think people do either. Um, I'm like, we might need some pads too. <laughs> like, oh man, football though is definitely the worst. I was just thinking about that. Like, whew. so what college did you play for? I played for Northeastern Junior College, and we set some records, you know, there. And then I went on to play at the University of Great Falls in Montana. Don't like to talk about that too much. Um, and then I went back home to finished my degree at the University of Colorado, but I didn't play there. Um, I played for the Fort Carson Army team, travel team. Mm -hmm. So um, with the men's team, I don't think they did this because there's plenty of dudes, but with the women's team, like you're familiar with this, you know, going out to the field for two weeks at a time or whatever for different training or whatever it might be, or if people get deployed. Um, so this is Fort Carson in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and they just needed extra bodies. So they let civilians play. And so my travel team coach from like, 10th grade, um, worked on base and was the Fort Carson coach. And so got, got the hook up there. So I still got to play, even though I was kind of like broken, my shoulder was messed up and didn't have the the same dream. I still got to finish out another season and while well, I finished my degree. So, so was you cool. still play intramural basketball or you still keep your shooting skills up or anything like that? You know, it's like a bike, get out there every once in a while and shoot. But I think I played a game last summer, just like with some, I was going to say kids, that makes me feel old. Some teenagers at the park <laughs> and I about died. 
Uh, so I'm not in, in good shape to play, but I definitely still like to shoot around a little bit. That's been one of the things that we did a lot more this summer with COVID and everything. So here you're saying you'll play a game of horse, but not a game of full court. Yeah, <laughs> probably. I could do even half court. We could do half court. 21, maybe do some 21, um, one or two rounds. I think, um, yeah, anytime I do that, I definitely expose the fact that I'm just not generally in shape. Any sport like basketball, it don't matter. Walking up the hills sometime. I'm yeah, like, you gotta be in shape to play basketball. Oh, yeah, it's really good. Like if you're, if you just hate running, like I hate just like running, you will never just see me just go for a run ever. But basketball is the same thing. You're running up and down the court and it's just way more fun. So Christina, you used to do a thing called War Choice Wednesday. What's that? You're going to change the War Choice Wisdom? Yeah. War Choice Wednesday. I started that when I was like a full-time employee at 3C Comms. And so it was very much, um, I had kind of like a vision for it, but then also trying to fit it in with 3C's business type. And then I kind of played around with like switching it up a little bit. And basically I was just kind of like talking about different words that are misused or overused and like some alternatives that we can use. And I started shifting it into things like how we can use people first language. I did a collab with the Almost Chillcast. Um, they have a, I don't know if they're still operating at the moment, but they have a series that they called like White People Wednesdays where they let like white folks call in, like send in their questions, not call in, but send in their questions. Um, so, you know, basically there's some questions you just don't want to burden certain folks with, but they're like, you can go ahead and burden us with your questions right now. And so we did a mashup around like what white complicity means um, and different things like that. And what I want to do with word choice wisdom is number one, not tie myself to a day of the week. <laughs> so you be doing this every day or? No, it's going to be um, like in season. So it's going to be podcast style, essentially. Um, I've got a couple different visions for it. I'm actually applying for a grant for it because I want to pay everybody to be a guest on there. And I have some very like um, specific people that I want to interview on for very specific reasons. Um, and just bringing out some of the, there's just new terminology that I feel like I'm learning like every day, especially on the internet, you know, people are finding new ways to describe things. And some of them have really just shifted the way, like, for example, one person I want to interview is our very own Nikita Oliver. And she calls the criminal justice system, the criminal punishment system. And just that I was like, cause I used to call it the injustice system, but the way, just from a language perspective, right. Again, like put your feelings aside, right. For a second, like that's more what it's about, right. When you think about like the court system and prisons and stuff, it's about punishment. It's not always about justice. Um, and if you're not familiar with restorative justice, I highly recommend looking into that, but let's go back to what we were talking about. <laughs> Word choice wisdom um, is just diving into yeah, some of those different ways to talk about different issues. Some of it's going to be a little bit more fun and lighthearted, not so intense, um, but how we can just find wisdom in the words that we choose. Can you talk about people having the power of, of vocabulary, how important that is? Yeah, it's it's too, those, it's another one where it's like, I might sound contradictory because like part of me is like, well, I don't want to be ableist around or elitist, right? Around like language and like what's proper English and <laughs> no, like let's let's not get too much into that. But what I've been saying this whole time, who's your audience? What's the situation? It does really, really matter in some in some situations, right? And I think um, in general with how we talk to each other and talk about each other, it's really important for us to get our language right and just have that respect for each other. So to me, it's super, super important, but I also don't want people to feel like they don't have enough knowledge or their vocabulary isn't big enough, or uh, I speak with an accent or I speak with, you know, my English is broken or I, some folks just choose to, they intentionally, right, choose to speak outside of the norm. So like finding a, a balance in there. So I don't know if you feel like you're being like forced out of your comfort zone that's a good thing learn grow if you feel like you're having to not be who you are and like having to completely change everything that you do and it makes you feel like you're just not being who you are then maybe you just need to find something else to do find a different um, place to fit in because I don't want us to get hung up on oh I'm not good enough or I don't know enough to be in this space or talk about this topic or something like that one thing drives me crazy like when people you know the Oxford comma right people get so hung up with the Oxford comma the comma like to me, it's not a big deal. Like, okay, comma, not comma. I know people, they're like, they're like gung-ho, like they're like all in like extra commas of all this. I just never got that right. Like, does it, I mean, people understand, right? Thank you. That's what it comes down to at the end of the day. <clears throat> Do they understand? Yes? Okay, cool. We're good then. However, 
it's fun, you know, when you are like, we all have things that we kind of like, what I would say, geek out about that we kind of, we're kind of nerdy about. Like we go into the deeps and the depths and people just don't care. Right. Like most people are like, whatever, <laughs> but you care about it. So yeah, language people, English people, you should use an Oxford comma because if you don't, you are changing the meaning of the sentence technically. But how often do we operate in technically? Like, there's so much nuance in the world. So if people understand it and it's um, especially like with less character counts and stuff like that, like don't tell me I have to add another character. <laughs> yeah, true. Um, so in the bio, it says, so what does it mean in your bio when you say you, you build connections? So what to your point, and how do you build connections? Yeah, earlier you were kind of asking me like, how do I balance all these different things that I do? And so I was trying to figure out like, what what do I do at a high, high level? You know how I feel about that question, but <laughs> gets asked a lot. So what do I do? And I think that's what I do at like a high level. I build connections. And so when it comes to the coaching consulting work, it's helping my clients build connections with their audience by helping them be a better communicator. When it comes to like the poor people's campaign and stuff, we're connecting different organizing groups together, different people. Sometimes um, the connections are also just connecting ideas and connecting facts. Um, so I feel like with training, for example, that's connecting different ideas and different skill sets and different people. Um, and I do that as a communication consultant, but I also do training as a part of my poor people's campaign work. So overall, I build connections. So how do you do this? Suppose you, you, you're coaching, consulting someone, and they're like a horrible communicator, right? Bad communicator. What steps, so how do you take them from being like horrible or bad to like, you know, at least halfway decent? Is there a process you have? Each person's different or certain exercises that you do? Yeah, you got it. Each person's different. I would say most folks come to me because they have a specific thing that they're working on. They have a competition coming up. Um, one person that I helped with, they were just about to start like a job searching. Like journey like kind of casually and they're like I just feel like I want to be a better communicator um and be able to just have some general tools so we built just kind of like a curriculum for them like a personal one-on-one -on -one curriculum just going over kind of the basics so I have different things around um like messaging development so like figuring out how to like where do I start <laughs> and then there's the actual like delivery of it um and storytelling is a big piece of that and so that's another, usually it's kind of its own module is like figuring out what are those winning stories that you want to tell. Um, if it's a quick pitch, how can you just add a little bit of a narrative to what you're talking about? Um, so yeah, it really just depends. But I will say that um, the workshop that I used to do was practice your pitch and then answering what do you do? So that was like very structured and like, here's kind of a formula. Let's figure out how to plug you into this formula. So let's talk about that real fast. Um, importance of your pitch and, and, and what you do. You don't do those anymore, right? Or do you still do those? I don't do them mostly because I prefer doing them in person. <laughs> um, also because uh, it's, it's just really easy to get like workshopped out <laughs> from my perspective. So I'm definitely looking at more evergreen content. I've got a Patreon space that I'm building out. So that's going to be one of the main, main ways to engage with like my different expertise. And then um, I've also got some toolkits coming out. So the first one that's gonna come out is a general business comms toolkit. So it's gonna have some templates for your kind of general emails, phone calls, that kind of stuff. And how do you go about finding your, 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 your customer? Your word of mouth, your marketing or just? Yeah, let me tell you, it's been a struggle. No. Uh, most of my, uh, I think I can actually go ahead and say all, I would say yeah, like about 95% has been word of mouth. Um, or folks have gotten to work with me through one of my volunteer projects. So whether it was 1 million cups or founders live different things where I do volunteer coaching, just usually like an hour, sometimes it's as a group. Um, so folks kind of meet me at that point. And then, um, with the workshop hosting, I am still willing to host them if other people want to host them and host me, right. And organize them and do all the audience building and stuff like that. That's another way that like I get exposure to new people. Um, but really I haven't done a lot of the traditional marketing stuff and I don't have like a very extensive built out like pipeline and funnel and all of that good stuff right right now, especially. I don't even have a business right now, <laughs> technically, just doing things independent outside of my 40 hour a week gig. Um, but 
I definitely um, want to do more with like getting on other people's podcasts. So, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and when we open back up, just getting back into the in-person stuff, I think that's like my bread and butter. Just even networking events is huge for me. So when people like speak in front of people, public speaking, how do you make sure that they're being authentic, so to speak, right? I think some people just talk to you like, I would never buy anything from them. They're like <laughs> fake. Like, is there a trick or not, not a trick, but is there a method to be seen authentic? Or is this like, is this, you're just either, or is it either authentic or you're not authentic? It's hard because like, what if your authentic self is like somebody who doesn't talk on a microphone? <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's, it's hard to be just like, that's just blanket advice that I don't know if I always agree with in terms of like, I'll just be authentic. I think that you definitely want to make sure that you're not trying to be somebody else, but you might have to put up a little bit more of a, a and speak outside of yourself. And so I think sometimes when we see that, like, oh, I don't know about that. I think the person just might be nervous and like they're coming off because they memorized their, their pitch and they're really buttoned up and got the hair slicked back or like whatever it is. And especially in Seattle, you're just like, what is this guy trying to sell? Um, and I almost feel bad for those people. Cause I'm like, oh, just, if you just chilled out a little bit, I was just like meeting your audience where they're at. Um, I think the trick is practice, 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 finding like what your voice is and like how you want to show up on stage. Cause we see it. We see where there's people who they get dressed to the nines and they've got the glam makeup and all the stuff anytime they're on the stage and then you've got like these other tech bros or even like Steve Jobs was known for the the turtleneck and the jeans right like so how can we have both well because people were doing what was comfortable for them and what made sense for them so you got to try different things maybe to find out what's good for you Christina talk about your uh 20 minute speed coaching like I mean what I mean you know what can get done in 20 minutes right that's I mean <laughs> I mean like you know just introductions you know like 20 minutes, is, it's a lot of time, but it's not a lot of time. Yeah. Um, so if we don't already know each other, we're not going to get to know each other in the 20 minutes speed coaching. I'll get to know a little bit about you. Um, I hope folks, if they read the description, are coming to it with something very specific. So they're like, I'm working on my investor pitch, or I'm working on my elevator pitch, or I've got this thing coming up and I've got to write a 200 word bio or less they're usually coming to be some, something specific to that, to that meeting. So we can just really drill in. And I'm just asking those questions that you've heard me ask so many times already is who is the audience? What's the situation? And then give it to me, give me a taste of it. Um, and then I give feedback and that's, I mean, that's, that's about what you can do in 20 minutes. Um, the other thing that I bring to the table that I think you might not get from other folks is the questions that I ask, uh, because I like to build connections. I might, think about some things and ask just of questions that have you thinking about some things that you might not have before. So I might help you see something that you haven't seen before. And then um, when we get into that word choice part of like, what's maybe the better way that we can phrase something or bringing what I find especially is bringing the benefit to the front. We tend to bury the, the good stuff. We start off with all this like fluffy context, which is great if you've got an hour, but usually don't. So like, how can we start with the benefit, grab their attention, and then whatever it is, whether it's written, you know, verbal, whatever, grab their attention first, and you can fill in the context later. So when somebody uses you as, as, a, as a coach or consulting communication, what do you expect from them? What do you expect them to bring to the table? I hope that, um, you know, they're coming to me because they feel like something needs to be different so that they're open to, you know, hearing my feedback. At the end of the day, though, like, I don't have any, like, high expectations. Um, I just kind of set the expectation that like you're going to get in what you put out of it. So I don't, I'm not too attached to how much you put into it, but the more you put into it, the more you're going to get out of it. And so like, I'm going to recommend a lot of things that people don't follow through on. And so if you don't follow through, then like, I, we can start over, <laughs> start back at, at point one. But it's like, if you don't go through those, those motions, at least, you know, even if you don't get a lot of effort, you don't have a whole lot of time, if you can at least get a little bit in, because if I don't see any improvement from session one to session two, that usually tells me you didn't do your homework, right? You didn't do what you're supposed to. And then I'm not just going to keep taking your money that's me, if, that's if you're not doing me, the work. That's me you fire them, right? Yeah, essentially. Um, and then most engagements start on a small scale. So it's just like, I might not work with them again, or I'm going to like be like, do you want me to just keep taking your money for you to talk to me? Do you, I mean, that could be your, I feel like at that point, am I your counselor? Sorry. 
uh, am I your counselor, your therapist? <laughs> like, uh, when are we going to do the work to actually improve? Um, and some people are just so uncomfortable. They won't even want to practice with me. And I'm like, oh, we got to work on uh, maybe some esteem stuff. And like, I, I was joking about therapy, but I, I'm a big proponent of it. And some folks like they literally probably need to go to therapy to get through some esteem things before we can get past the, the delivery stuff that they're getting hung up on. Cause there's like something else there that they're probably not going to talk to me about. Right. Yeah. So Christina, you've been an like, entrepreneur for a few years, right? Can you talk about some of the challenges of being an entrepreneur, like the pitfalls and, you know, successes you've had? Yeah. I mean, I've been an entrepreneur on and off for about 10 years and it's been on and off because those pitfalls are not having enough money. <laughs> uh, you know, our first generation in terms of like going to college and stuff like that. So there's no family fund. <laughs> There's no first round uh, raising uh, with the family. Um, although my dad's business is doing really well. So I'm really proud of him and how he's grown that. But I've seen the entrepreneur struggle and the ups and downs of it from a young age. So I kind of knew to expect that. So I think that helped me. Um, and for me, really, it's just been about figuring out like, what is my actual purpose? And what do I want like to be the, the like legacy business that I want to build out for a long time? Because I've started businesses, stopped them. I've helped co-found businesses. I've dabbled here and there. I've done sales stuff. I've done stuff that's not possibly legal in certain situations. <laughs> um, so like, I've always just kind of like hustled my way through, through making money to survive. Um, but then trying to figure out like, okay, as an entrepreneur, when you think about it in this like more lofty sense of like, okay, I'm going to build out a business that theoretically some people want to leave something behind to their family or that you're going to sell off or like whatever it is. But um that's kind of where I'm at is figuring out like what's going to be my legacy business. I think that's the term I'm using right now. It'll probably change. So what advice do you have for new entrepreneurs just starting out? Like they have an idea, like, and they're like, you know, they're not what I call like, you know, um, I can't think of the word I'm looking for. Like they're not phased. Like they think they're going to, you know, get like make a million dollars in six months. They're going to take over the world in six months. You know, there's no challenges. They're mm -hmm. going to be peachy keen. What are you going to tell them? Yeah. They probably, following the wrong people on Instagram. Uh, <laughs> Probably so, right? Like, I think if you just have an idea and like you want to build it, like you can you can do that without necessarily having to be a full-time entrepreneur. So I think number one, understand that you can do it without doing whatever, like this big risk-taking, like quit my job. Like it doesn't have to be so dramatic and like a full-time thing. If you feel called to do that, then yeah, you got to be ready for that and I think for some people that means they need to have that savings built up because they can't handle that pressure of like the money is running out the money is running out um so maybe you need to build up your savings first maybe you need to downsize your life a little bit right like cut some of those expenses to figure that out um maybe you do want to keep your job and test the waters a little bit and see what's going on but if you really just think you're going to just like get like who, who's thinking that bring them send them to me because I want to talk to them and figure out where they got this crazy idea because even the people who have the big glamorous lifestyles mention that they're they at least mention it they might not get into the nitty-gritty but they at least mention that like hey it wasn't always like this so yeah I mean like yeah. remember what you think about Mark Zuckerberg I mean I had an interview like a long time ago but like Facebook first like quote unquote made it and the people need to ask well Mark was to make seem to be like overnight succession well, if you count my six months of six years of coding in my parents' basement, well, it's, that's it's overnight. Yeah, I'm overnight sensation, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's actually the better way to say it. <laughs> Just the overnight sensation, not the overnight success. Uh, and I think even with like Steve Jobs, people don't realize that Apple didn't come out like maybe eight years after he started it, right? Right. And um, I do think that's the other thing too is like looking at your network and your support network because like those people had the support you know like they were able to kind of grind it out like he said be in his parents basement there's a lot of people whose parents don't have basements and, and just like <laughs> you know and what's the story like i think it was bill gates mother was a, a board the IBM, ibm chairman or something you know listen right you know like you know i think jeff Bezos' parents gave him three hundred thousand dollars i mean and his wife worked full-time and yeah, provided health insurance you know, and raised his children yeah, yeah steve dropped me everybody like, you saw all these connections right? yeah, yeah. so it, that's the other thing too i guess then is like we get hung up on the individual like he yeah. did this well yeah he he's smart genius level he did a lot but he you know everyone has some help yeah everybody i oh i hate the term self-made that could just be caught on fire and thrown away if you ask me there's no such thing 
I know what people want to be and that it's like, uh, you know, you weren't inherited this like business or whatever. Uh, I think the one that really got under my skin within the last year was, uh, and I hate talking about them, but uh, which one of the, Karda- or the Kylie Jenner became the first billionaire or something. Get the f- self-made who, what, when, where, hot, huh? Who? Ew. I, yeah, if, if you don't, if you agree with that, I don't know. We probably wouldn't get along, but <laughs> I'm just like, what? Her whole family's got, what? So I don't know, I guess that that goes back to though in general with word choice, right? Like who's defining the word? What what does it mean to people? Are we on the same page here? Clearly not on the same page with whoever named her that. <laughs> so Christina, what's your your take on the Seattle startup community? Is it going the right way? Is it needs a lot of work or is, is it collaborative enough? Or what's your take on that? Um, I think it's very collaborative. I don't have a lot to compare it to, right? So like this is the only like startup community I've really been in. Um I do think that there still seems to be a little bit of silos, like in some senses, in terms of just maybe like types of business or like different technologies or whatever. Not only that, like, like there's a lot of like the startup ground, Founders Live, Seattle Angel Conference, there's all these things, right? And like what mean cups, you know? Yeah. And like how much do they really cross collaborate, you know? I'm not sure. That's a good that. question. I think, yeah, maybe from a, I think they do a good job of talking about each other, right? So like for just knowing myself, like, when I was doing both coaching for Founders Live and One Million Cups, like I was that just actual connection between the two. But here's, here's a good question for you. When you were doing Founders Live and Million Cups, how many people from Million Cups going to Founders Live and people from Founders Live going to Million Cups, you know? Yeah, it was funny because we were trying to figure out like a way to like almost make that like a pipeline. Like One Million Cups is a little bit smaller, more intimate setting. You have more time. Like you graduate to Founders Live. And kind of graduate to Founders Live. Um I think with Founders Live, it just grew so fast. It got so big. And they talk about something like a venture funded, like that's just scale like quickly. Like, so whoa. quickly. I, and it's so crazy because like- Is there a city he's not in right now? I don't know. <laughs> like not a major like, one. He's going to Kenya, Australia, like this. Yeah, crazy. global. Like it's crazy how like quickly the the concept just caught on. And it really, what's funny about that is, I don't know if you know, like Nick's story on that, but like it started out with not like those intentions. No, yeah. So the story, yeah. that's the other thing too. I think if you're an entrepreneur, like have aspirations to like get into the scene and just kind of see what's going on, try something out. You don't always have to know what it's going to turn into. Like if you're feeling called toward or drawn towards it, you can always quit. <laughs> like you can always stop if it's not working out the way you thought it would. And for those you don't know what we're talking about, there's an organization oh, yeah. started in Seattle called Founders Live, started by a guy named Nick Hughes like a real good startup guy here in Seattle. And he just started as like a little meetup together, gather some friends, right? You know, what premise is five people go do a 99 second pitch. People vote. If you win the vote, you know, you get to pitch for five minutes and people ask you questions and pretty like pretty detailed and like pretty detailed questions, right? Like these are pretty hard questions, but 99 second pitch, that's pretty hard to do, right? Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, it's like no name tags, go out gather in the, the, the fireplace, something like that, you know, real like real open community, right? Mm-hmm. And it has just blown up, right? I think he started like two, three years ago. Well, yeah. So it used to be called Feature Friday. Feature Friday. <laughs> Way back. That. Yeah. So that's, that was probably like five or six years ago. Um, but yeah, Founders Live launched, I think, three years ago, maybe less. And and now it's like, yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure it's not a major season I didn't write. I mean, it's like London, Nairobi, Kenya, I mean, Nigeria. Yeah. It's, he's, he's everywhere. And he like, and he just like, his volunteer city leaders that run everything and it's, it's blown up like. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a big deal. And then there's the platform behind it, too. Mm-hmm. So, like, that's, I think, part of, like, like, why the success and, like, why it's been able to grow the way it has, I think, is because it's not just the events. Yeah, the there's another element to it. Sponsorships, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, if you if you are in the startup scene and you don't know about Founders Live, you should get involved because it's a good way to raise your own profile. Um, I know I ended up on Andy Lyons's um, podcast, And I think it's called the startup life, but she's the Boston city leader for founders live. And so you're getting to be in front of crowds of people. You're getting to meet all these different, um, founders, but you're also going to end up meeting some different investors. And like, your name's going to be known as somebody like who's building community and like, yeah, it's another volunteer thing where you're putting in like those hours. Um, but even if, if you do something similar to what I do, volunteering to be like the coach or to, like contribute in some way, even if it's not Founders Live, finding ways to like contribute to the community within, you know, your limits. It's just a way to raise your profile a little bit too. So it helps you. I mean, you could speak on probably 
with just even doing your podcast, right? Like how that opens up connections and opportunities. Yeah, so definitely look at shout out to Nick Hughes for building a great organization. And if you're out there like building a, a nonprofit or even trying to scale a scale a scale a startup, Nick Hughes definitely has a process down pat. So he's definitely did something right. Yeah, and he's like from Yakima, so like I, I you don't have that. to be like from the city to if you if you're somewhere out in the in the um, smaller towns, like come on in. Well, COVID, but come on in <laughs> virtually and no one will. We'll be in person again one yeah, day. Yeah, but definitely a lot of people out there do a lot of great things. I mean, that's not necessarily you know, a bunch of different cities, San Antonio, Austin, you know, Boston, you know, people doing good things everywhere. Mm -hmm. And if you're not in those big cities, like, I think that's even better opportunity. Like you can be the big fish in the small pond, as they say. So like, how can you cultivate something? Reach out to Nick. Like, I'm sure he would be open yeah. to that. You yeah, know, Nick, Nick is very responsive. At least to me is, you know, yeah. Answers within a day. Yeah. Um. And that, I think, you know, that goes to building community as well, just so that like your name, you, that's another thing, your name, your emails get answered when people recognize your name. <laughs> yeah, that does help, right? It helps. So talk about the power of intro. Yeah, I uh, had a professor in college and he, he didn't use this like elevator pitch term or anything like that. He's all like, we're going to work on our power intros. And uh, it's basically like, how you would introduce yourself, but instead of just saying, hi, my name's Christina, <laughs> right? It's really introducing yourself in the way he put it. He was just like, he wanted us to talk about like how we're changing the world. He's like, so like not focused again, back to what I keep saying, right? What's the benefit? What's the impact? Not what do you do? Um, because if I say I coach and consult, that doesn't mean anything. Like at the end of the day, right? Like it literally doesn't mean anything. You have no context outside of that. Like, what does that mean? Um, so a power intro is how you talk about yourself, introduce yourself, but in a way that is powerful and talks about your impact versus your title or your whatever. Christina, talk about the importance of this, not entrepreneurs, but people in general to put themselves out there, right? I mean, putting yourself there, maybe like, you know, we're social media, personal branding, letting yeah. people know what you're doing. I don't know where we're going with this whole internet thing and like social media and stuff. Um, but I feel like there's going to be maybe like the kids who are being like born right now. Like, I don't think content creator is going to be a thing. Like everybody's just going to do it. Like there's not going to be like a term for it per se. Like it's just going to be kind of like folks are out here creating content. Like, I think it's great that as a society, we're tapping more into our creativity. Um, I don't know about the, the devices. That's another thing, but, um, being able to, yeah, just speak for yourself. Right. And tell your own story. Right. In general, I think is powerful powerful in itself um I do think a lot of it though really is tied to it's it's capitalism at some point you're gonna have to sell yourself to get the job to get the thing whatever to get the loan like you're gonna have to put your best foot forward and use your words um if you're able to talk about yourself to put yourself out there and like why would you not want that to be the best that it could be so why do you think some people still I don't use this word scared but like you know not um not willing to do that still there's yeah it all comes back down to like that like self-esteem type stuff and whatnot like we do it is fear like we don't want to say that because we don't want to like be mean to somebody and like oh you're scared but there's a risk of putting yourself out there especially with the internet and screenshot and screen record and like you never know and like so you can get hung up and like shopping, all that kind of stuff that's all that too right so like it can be just nerve-wracking it within that and um some folks like our our world's definitely set up more for the extrovert right so i think there's just a lot of people who get left out in that in that sense um i would say um some people too just don't want to be like burdensome <laughs> like they don't want to talk they don't want to come off as salesy all the time or like i think that's i think i see more of a hesitation with consistency than like really getting out there um, but maybe that's because I'm not seeing the people who aren't putting themselves out there come through. Um, but yeah, I think it's a lack of consistency comes from like, for me personally, even like, I want to post about this every day, like people get it. But at the same time, I do notice, um, like within my Instagram stories, like sometimes there's people who only look at my content once a month or something. So yeah, they didn't see it yesterday because they weren't looking at my stories yesterday. Um, so finding that balance, I think, and just getting more comfortable again, practice, practice. And so this remind me of something. I, 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 it's all over the, the internet now, right? That guy, 
uh, talking about like putting yourself out there and posting content if you don't want to. Like that, it was still like a dog face twenty, dog face four twenty. Oh yeah, that guy. Yeah, you know the guy. I mean, he was said like you know he's like he did the video of himself on the skateboard. Right, for those of you who don't know, this guy named Dog Face four twenty. He's a, a mechanic in Idaho. Truck broke down, and so he took the skateboard. I think it's called a longboard, right? I think I guess yeah. there's a difference. Huh. Whatever. Some, something yeah. like longboard skateboard. He's like drinking Osmond spray cranberry and, you know, lip syncing to a Leewood Max song, right? Yep. And he, he said, like, I was going to post this, right? But Gary Vaynerchuk said, no, post, like, in his mind, no post content all the time. So he posted it. And for posting this 30 second video, if they don't know, like, you came like a personal representative of Osmond spray. The Fleetwood Max song went like number seven in the world. The album went number 10 in the world. Like, he was able to pay, uh, he was, he was he was living in a trailer with no electricity, no water. Him and yeah. his daughter, he just paid cash three hundred twenty three hundred twenty thousand dollars cash for a house. He has a long war coming after him. I like he's the commercial cane. This is for a thirty second video, right? Yeah, and I think it's very important that you have to put stuff out there, right? Because it can be like yeah, changing. especially if you like you have an idea, right? Like I think I was thinking more of people who are just like I don't want to have to do it, like. But yeah, if you've got an idea and you're just afraid, you better get over that shit and just put it out there. Um, I saw him do an interview. He said he knew he made it when he got offered to do a commercial with Snoop Dogg to doing a, like a door launch, right? He said, I, I know I, I, I've made it when I do commercial with Snoop Dogg. Yeah, uh, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, I love I love seeing his story blow up. And uh, I follow him on Instagram. So I see he makes other similar TikToks and stuff with the juice. And it's, yeah, it's crazy, uh, right? It's just like a nice escape too. Like that everything doesn't have to be serious and like no. um, changing the world. You don't have to have like some... I mean, he is changing the world, though, like in his own way. But yeah. like, you can just do something because you want to sometimes if it's not hurting other people. Yeah. And people don't realize, too, like, you know, like, like he's making all these commercials, right? A lot of these big time companies are going like TikTok, Instagram, finding, you know, quote unquote influences and quote unquote social media stars in commercial, right? Yeah. Versus going to traditional, you know, TV route, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's the way to go. Even people who do still watch regular TV often uh, fast forward to the commercials. Um, and then I think from folks, maybe who have a budget more like ours, um, it doesn't have to be somebody with 50,000 followers or who went viral. It doesn't have to be somebody, you know, like that. If somebody has a lot of engagement, I look at engagement. So when I'm looking at people that I might want to partner with or something like that, if they only got 500 followers, cool. Are they getting 50 likes on their posts though? They got 10%? Like that's good. Pretty good yeah. Right. So like, I'm, I'm thinking more about that. Like who's, I'm, I'm not in the the wide net business i'm not posting ads i'm, I'm probably never going to post an ad maybe things will change my goals will change but how i see my things going right now in the near future that's just not even aligned with like what i want to be doing i don't want to spend my time trying to figure all that stuff out and work on that i like that i'm able to sustain myself and, and keep my projects going with word of mouth so um but looking at influencers if you do want to pay somebody yeah i think the more the engagement is the important part, not the number of followers. So what is the vision for yourself, your business and all your, all your social issues, right? How are you going to like align those together for your long-term plan, so to speak? Ooh. Yeah, <laughs> great, great question. Uh, I ask myself this all the time. I think long-term, well, first of all, like the goal, like the real, real goal is to have all my bills paid through passive income and bills, including saving, investing, right? Like all of that. So then everything else is just purely because I'm like, yep, I want to do that. And if it's something that makes money, great. If it's not cool, I'm still going to go work on it. Right. So if it's, you know, something that's more social justice focused or whatever, um, with that being said though, too, with different creative projects, like I'm looking at grants, you know, like I'm looking at different ways to just, um, and this is why I want to work with other entrepreneurs who are looking at different ways to get paid for our, our creative efforts or for those social innovators like it's work to be out here there's literally people who've been in the streets for 180 days straight right now sorry to bring it back to politics but like i want to see those people like how can we find a way to crowdfund and something right like so different things like that so i could see it as being from like where my skill sets come into play maybe having some form of like incubator or something like that to take people from you know step one to step two and like monetizing whatever it is that they're passionate about. Um, also could see that just being attached to some sort of job skills training. Like we still like, yeah, entrepreneurship and all that, like it's, it's grand. It's not for everybody. Like some people just need some skills 
or maybe they do want to do what I would consider it's it's entrepreneurship still, but it's not like what everybody thinks about. It's your your independent mechanic and plumber and like again, like those those skills that we still need. We still need these laborers, but maybe they can do it in a way where they're getting paid a little bit more of what they're worth and they're they're building a again a legacy business or something like that that's not just working hourly and trading time for money so when, you, when you're doing coaching do you have a different method if someone's an introvert or extrovert oh yeah because if you're introverted so i'm gonna be a little bit more delicate <laughs> in a sense um want to ease you into it because what i see sometimes with introverts is if you go a little bit like too hard too fast they just clam up and then it just like gets worse and worse and worse. And like, it's like, okay, let's, let's call it a day and <laughs> come back. Uh, I don't think I'm scary. <laughs> um, but with extroverts, like, I'm talking about myself, so I guess I can say it. There tends to be a little bit more of an arrogance factor that can come into play. Um, so I can be a little bit more um, just straight to the point. I think sometimes with those folks and be like, okay, well, let's nitpick, right? Because you've got the general volume and the, the presence and, let's nitpick now. What are you doing with your hand? Like, you know, and just kind of mess with them a little bit. I usually use humor a lot um, to just try to make it a little bit like you're taking criticism in. It just sucks. It doesn't matter how nice it is or how people on say, point it people is. People say all the time, don't take it personal. How can you not take it personal? You're talking about me. Yeah. <laughs> like it is very personal. So it just kind of sucks. So I try to find like, and that's again, building relationships is so important. Um, I'm not going to do that the first time that I sit down with somebody who I've, you know, never met before. And then I always do a session before we actually do any sort of coaching just to get to know each other. And that's free just to make sure that like, yeah, we are going to vibe and this is isn't, there. yeah, it just really has to be there. Um, and I definitely want to, um, I think build up a little bit more of a, a referral list for folks where it's just not going to click. Like I want to help you, but I just feel like, but I'm not the person for you. Yeah. Like I just don't feel like it's fitting. Um, and then some folks like they're just not really they don't need a coach yet like they just need to do some of the basics and stuff so that's where the patreon comes into play like you don't have to pay me my hourly fee which I, i'm completely worth it but that's not where you're at yet go to the patreon spend a little bit less for a few months get some skills up then come back to me and we can really refine what you're working on but sometimes it's like well i got a pitch next week so what's up <laughs> and like we're just gonna have to make it work and then we make it work and that's fine too so you already answered this a little bit but how you do people like they, they speak they speak for you the first time and they're like i'm the best speaker ever um, blah 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 and you're like thinking to myself oh my god this might be the worst speech i've ever seen heard in my life right like, how do you break that down oh that would be funny i haven't had that one come up yet um i would say in general like if folks are seeking me out right like that that's not going to be an issue mm -hmm. but maybe if it was somebody where an organization hired me to come in because i've kind of seen with that where we were working with microsoft and like we sent out the email, they had to book their sessions and stuff. And like one person just like, wasn't booking the session. Cause they're like, oh no, I'm fine. <laughs> and then they did their presentation and it was fine. So I'm like, why fine? You've got resources to make it great. Um, and so that was like, we just kind of talked to the, to the manager about it. We didn't address it with that person. So I'm not really sure how I would go about that, but I have to say it would probably be a guy who would do that if we're being honest. Um, so I just be like, okay, bro, like, <laughs> like let's, let's, let's get into it then. And then I would just be super nitpicky. And like, I'd probably bring out more of the like sports kind of vibe. Like, I, I, you know, I'm an athlete still. So like, I would, there'd be some shit talking probably. That's the short answer. <laughs> yeah. So how do you, like how many clients can you handle at one time? Do you have a limit? Right now, because of the, this like anchor contract that I have, that's 40 hours a week, uh, which I hate doing hourly contracts, but money, <laughs> consistent money. I'll take it. Um, so like, yeah, right now, um, basically, cause it depends on like what kind of package they're buying, but I wouldn't want more, I think than like two or three people right now on a, on the one-on-one -on -one and like keeping that time on the calendar type of situation, just because I don't want my energy to be, I could, of course, you can always squeeze in another meeting. Right. But like, am I going to be present? Am I going to have the energy? Probably not. So I'm definitely keeping it limited right now. Um, but other than that, like if I got to a point where I felt like, oh, I couldn't handle this, like if I was doing this full time, uh, I think it sounds like it's time to train some folks and hire some folks to get some get some other coaches on on the team. So I think that's that would be an indicator to me if I started to feel like, OK, I don't know if I can do this many in one week or one month or whatever. I would look to just grow in that way. And your closest are like time based, project based or how does that work? 
the coaching sessions themselves are time-based and then the larger consulting, um, where there might be more like back and forth stuff and email reviewing documents, stuff that's a little bit more process versus like coaching is really like you can compare it to a personal trainer at the gym, like you're paying for the sessions. Um, with that said, if you buy them, if you just buy an hour, that's 222. But if you buy. Here's a good question for you. Like for every hour of coaching, like you're coaching me one-on-one, -on -one, one hour, how much, how many hours do you spend like getting ready for that? What's the prep time for that? Now I've got it down to it's about an hour of prep time. Um, but it took me a while at first, depending on like what the situation would be, because I'd want to do all this research on the company and like trying to figure that out. So I've kind of figured out like a balance of like getting enough information to go into the meeting and, and be effective um, without spending like so much time preparing. Um, and then now I've also got like templates and things like that that just obviously speed things up. And what do you do for fun? Or is all stuff you talk about what you do for fun or, you, or something else <laughs> totally different you do for fun? Um. I do find fun in like all of this, like the coaching, especially like that, that is fun for me. So much fun. But like, what do I do? Maybe more for like play joy, like kind of yeah. type of stuff. Um, I'm a big stoner, you know, in the evenings. I like to just get high and watch some Netflix. That's my, that's my go-to. But um, I just recently discovered that I like puzzles. <laughs> I know well, that's well, well, high. Well, high. Yes. Um, we got one that was glow in the dark, you know, real <laughs> um, cannabis friendly. Um, and I just like, I, I like to brainstorm and plan. My partner's a musician. So like he's got his studio set up. So like sometimes he's just playing around with beats and I might try to freestyle or something. I'm not good at it at all. Um, I like hanging out with my, my friends. So this is, it's been a hard time, but I like literally love to talk if you, you know this about me. So like, if we're just hanging out, that's, that's a good time to me. So let's talk about your love for cannabis. You brought it up. <laughs> Since I brought it up. Um, yeah. How long have you been doing that? Like, how do you get started? Like, hmm. since you were a high school stoner, quote unquote, you got to no. do later on in life. Not in high school. You started when you came to Seattle. <laughs> Not when I came to Seattle. Um, somewhere in between there. Yeah, no. I uh, definitely did not smoke in high school because my parents are cannabis users as well. And they would just know. Like, I just knew there was there was zero hiding it, whatever. And then even when I got into college, there was zero hiding it, but I still tried. Uh, so it was like college when I got into it. Um, and then like I was talking earlier, like there's those things that we geek out and nerd, nerd out about. So now that I'm older and like kind of established more of a practice with it and like learning about the terpenes and like figuring out what type of strains I want during different types of the day or different times of the day. Yeah, um, weed, that stuff's overwhelming, right? Like when I was growing up, <laughs> it's a dime bag of weed, you know, now it's like how do you want to, how do you want to feel? What's your mood? You know, yeah. this, 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 and like all these options, this gram, this milligram, yeah. liquid form, smoke form, like, ah, oh, it's too much. No, like I, I can't, I can't deal with it. It's overwhelming. Yeah. What's uh, it called bud tenders, you know? Yeah, definitely. Bud tenders, um, good folks. The, they're, they're like, you know, a mixture between there's, it's like any more, like if you think of like a higher end store where like the cashier, it's not just a cashier, right? Like they're an expert on the product. So these folks, like they know what they're talking about. Usually there's a lot of stuff though, with the, the legalization that's really uh, kind of jack things up though. Cause like all the regulation is in like the money and stuff like that, but there's not a lot of regulation around um, like the pesticides and the reporting on those things and the testing. So there's a lot of stuff when you look at a label, there's like a lot of information on it that if you don't know how to decode that information, uh, it doesn't really mean anything to you. Yeah. And especially if you're like, yeah, like I'm not really a smoker like that. Like I just wanna get high, like what is all this? You know, yeah. I could see it being very overwhelming if you're not into that and like thinking about it and the learning science about of it. it. So it's speaking you know. I got, man, I'm getting more and more into it. So there's a company out here called Halo Cannabis and the presentation was just around the corner in here or no, up on the 14th floor in this building. Um, I was learning about, yeah, the science behind making the extracts. And so this, this woman who started the company, she's got her some sort of chemistry related degree from Northwestern University, like super smart, brilliant mind. And she was looking at the market, like, you have no idea what you're getting, like all these things. And so, you know, she developed her own brand, but there's so much science and cool stuff behind it. And then there's of course the CBD side, that's not, you know, the side yeah. that, I mean, I use CBD as well, but I. And there's like now so what, what, uh, what's called um, cannabis infused restaurants going on, making millions of dollars. It's like, 
Yeah. Um, it's incredible. I love to see it in general. What I would love to see more, some equity. Uh, there's still a lot of people sitting in jail for yeah, that's one thing I have an issue with, right? Like all these people make money that's fine and good, but there's just so many people in jail. Still, like, I still don't get, I don't get that right. In this state, in Colorado, in these states that people are making so much, it's it's very infuriating and um it's 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 tough. So um I don't know if this is appropriate to say, but like if you know somebody who grows and like again community, right? Like it's a gift, quote unquote a <laughs> gift. But like ah, does everything have to be so mainstreamed and so fast? And then when you think about capitalism and innovation and the need to like, so there's all these products coming out, and then like where's the accountability in the actual like safety of the product? And then back to what we said before with yeah. like, well, with this specific thing, there was this very deep, deep rooted inequity that's going to happen now for f- futures to come like and then like it's crazy and then if like you're, you're you have a cannabis business you're making money right i could be wrong but you still can't put money in banks right because it's federal like, it's so fucked up so it's dangerous <laughs> I, 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 there was a story in colorado a couple years ago i mean the booming marijuana business you literally had like hundreds of thousand of dollars in the store right and you couldn't put no right so you had like had, they basically had to arm, hire like armed guards mm-hmm. to, to keep people from stealing right because they knew he was making money hand over foot what are the phrases, right? You try to go to the bank, they tell them, no, we can't take your money. Mm-hmm. Even though it's legal here, yeah, it's, it's craziness. Yeah. Um, I think if I was a marijuana owner, I'd, 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 I'd be big in Bitcoin, I think. Yeah, I don't even know. I think there's laws around that, though, too. Cause I don't Probably know. So. Uh, it's, yeah, it's it's definitely messed up. Um, but I think, yeah, first and foremost, free all political prisoners. I consider people who are victims of the war on drugs, whether it's weed or any, you know, nonviolent drug possession, I consider that a political prisoner. So yeah, that's, that's the main thing for me. And then we can worry about the business side later. <laughs> Let the people go. <laughs> Christina, I understand you have a gift for our listeners today. Yeah, I definitely want to make sure like anybody who comes from the Jason Kavnis HR podcast is gets priority for that 20 minute coaching. So if you go onto that link and you see that there aren't any more dates available, just email me and I will make sure that you get your free 20 minute speed coaching. And can you give us your social media link so people can reach out to you? Yeah, I'm at underscore C-B-R-E-N-N-A-N, C Brennan on uh, Twitter and Instagram and then just Christina Brennan on LinkedIn, if that's more of your flavor. And those are really the only ones <laughs> I'm on I'm other places. You can also find uh, some information on workwithcbrennan.com. And for a listener who has the links to her gift and the social media links on our show notes, you can find the show notes at www.cabinetshlblog.com. Be sure to share this episode with your friends. Christina, what kind of a talk? Can you give us any advice or wisdom or any stuff you want to cover? Ooh, I would just say that... Uh, We are in an interesting time right now, and I hope that if you had a new idea come through or you had something that's, you know, been on your heart that you let it go, because like I think we learned that there's a lot that uh, we're we're not promised right tomorrow or things could change, the system could change, their surroundings could change, so like don't hold on to whatever it is, like get that idea out there, start that project, do that thing, put it out there. Christina, thanks for being here today, I really appreciate it. Thank you, this was so much fun. And to listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.